welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us for today's workshop. Uh, we're really excited about this one because we've not really ever co covered um, the topic of herbs um, too extensively in our curriculum. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Uh, we really encourage you though um, to use this time to also ask questions, even if it is not specifically about this curriculum. So if you um, are experiencing any um, you know, issues or challenges in your garden, or if you just have any questions about any other topics that are um, covered in the program, uh, we want to hear those as well today. So keep that in mind. Um, so we'll just go ahead and jump right in and I think. Um, so just some quick introductions from each of us and I'll start with you, Emma. Yeah, good morning, everybody. My name is Emma Dewey. Um, I'm the farming and gardening advisor and the cul de -Sac program manager at the Center of Southwest Culture. Um, I am from Albuquerque, born and raised, and I've been farming for about nine years now. And herbalism has been a passion for me for my whole life. So I'm really excited to be here uh, teaching this curriculum for you today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jose Manuel Castro Lopez. I am the program coordinator for CODESE in San Brown Salud, and I'll also be the translator for uh, this same uh, workshop, but in Spanish. So thank you for having me here today. And my name is Kateri Izuni. I'm the associate director for the Center of Southwest Culture, and I also run this program, uh, Sembrando Salud. Um, so I'm glad to see um, folks who have joined and uh, look forward to seeing other folks as we continue to head out um, throughout New Mexico to drop off more supplies. So uh, I think we'll just go ahead and jump right into it. I'll let Emma take it away. So today's topics are going to cover a few different things. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about herbal classifications, um, how we uh, classify different types of herbs. We're also going to talk about herbal actions. Uh, so that's going to go into the types of things that herbs actually do. Um, we'll also talk about the specific culinary and medicinal herbs that are included in all of our Sembrando Salud gardening kits this year. And we're also going to talk a little bit about actually making some medicine. So just to give a little bit of background on herbs, um, plants have been used for centuries um, since ancient times. All civilizations uh, have some record of using plant medicine uh, for healing purposes. Um, in Europe, herbal medicine was the primary form of healthcare until the 19th century, uh, and that was until modern medicine gained popularity. And we also know here in North America that the indigenous peoples here have been using plant medicine for thousands of years and continue to use uh, remedies to treat various ailments um, by traditional healers. So now we'll get into just a little bit about the classifications of herbs. Um, this is really simplified. Um, but medicinal herbs are used for healing. Culinary herbs are herbs that are used for cooking. So that can include things like uh, cilantro or basil. Um, ornamental herbs are herbs that are just really nice to look at. Um, so that means that they may not really have any types of medicinal or culinary properties, but they look really pretty in the garden. And lastly, aromatic herbs. So for these ones, think about like aromatherapy, um, traditionally used as like essential oils, things that smell really good, like lavender and rosemary. Next, we're gonna get into a little bit more uh, complicated information. Um, this is gonna be a an overview on the different types of actions that herbs have. 
Um, this is not a complete list. Herbal actions are, there's so many. Um, we, we could make a list that goes on forever. But these are some of the most common ones. And these are the ones that um, we're actually going to go over in the types of herbs that were included in your gardening kits. So um, these properties, um, we're going to go over them kind of alphabet style. Um, adaptogens are herbs that help to restore your overall balance um, and strengthen the functioning of the body. Um, these ones typically will not have any kind of impact on um, like causing imbalances on different systems. Like if you're using it for something uh, like stress, it won't impact a different part of your body negatively. So it helps to support your whole system. Alteratives are herbs that support your body's own natural processes um, and help to restore bodily functions. So these are herbs that are going to help, um, again, with just restoring your overall system, making sure that all of your body's functions are working properly. Analgesics are herbs that function as pain relievers and fever reducers. So sometimes you'll hear the words like anti-inflammatory. Um, this kind of falls within that category. Um, all of these herbs are going to have some kind of effect that helps with lowering pain and helping to reduce fevers. Antimicrobials are herbs that have an antibacterial or antiviral property. Um, so these are really effective for treating um, like infections or if you have some kind of illness, they can help to reduce the longevity of different illnesses. Um, and then the last one on this slide is astringents, which are herbs that help to dry, draw or shrink tissue. Um, which helps to create a barrier in the skin. Um, so those kinds of herbs, um, typically, like if you think about something like witch hazel, which is a really common kind of astringent that is used um, as a toner for your face, um, it helps to shrink uh, the skin tissue, um, which can also be really helpful for drawing out splinters and things like that. Um, the next one is carminatives. So these are herbs that are really helpful for your digestive symptom, uh, system. <laughs> um, so they can help to reduce or prevent excess gas. Uh, some examples are peppermint, cloves, ginger, and chamomile. Okay, uh, so the next ones are demulcents, which are herbs that you can take internally that help to coat, soothe, and protect your mucous membranes. Um, licorice is a really common one that's used for this. Um, also marshmallow. Um, there's also a different type of native uh, mallow, which is called globe mallow. Um, that is really useful for helping to coat and soothe uh, irritated mucous membranes like your throat and your sinuses. Diaphoretics are different types of herbs that help to raise your body temperature that make you sweat. Um, and that can also help to stimulate circulation, which helps to cool the body through increased perspiration or through sweating. Um, so some examples of this one are things like cayenne or any other type of chili plant. Um, also tulsi, uh, which is included in your gardening kit is another one that can help to make you sweat more. The next one is emollients. So these are similar to demulcents, but they're specifically used topically, which means that it's something that you would use on your skin. Um, so these help to soothe, condition, and protect the skin. 
uh, for all sorts of things like burns or insect bites, um, scrapes, scratches, bruises, uh, things like that. And some examples of that are the calendula um, that we included in your gardening kit. Um, using the flowers for, um, for that is a traditional use of calendula um, for many, 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 many years. So um, that's a really cool one to use. Expectorants are herbs that encourage coughing. So if you have any kind of like respiratory thing that's like hanging out in your chest, um, expectorants are going to help to encourage coughing that'll break up all of the mucus in your lungs, which helps you to um, reduce the length of your sickness. And then the last couple that we're going to cover are nervines, which are herbs that specifically support the nervous system. So they can be herbs that are used either topically or internally. Um, if you're using it internally, it can be really supportive of your nervous system, like um, your brain, obviously, um, and the nerves throughout your body that respond to stress. Um, so they're really effective for helping with sleep, um, with any kind of like um, mental stress or depression, um, lots of different types of things like that that originate in your nervous system. Topically, um, if you have any kind of nerve damage, um, or if you have an injury that's related to your nerves, um, they can be really useful for that as well, uh, just as a topical application. And then lastly, tonics are herbs that can be taken every day um, in small amounts that help to just overall tone and strengthen the body systems. Um, so some uh, types of tonics that you can take are like uh, catnip, um, licorice can be taken in small amounts. Um, let's see, there's just all kinds of different tonics that you can take. Um, and then they kind of function just as uh, like an overall health booster. So they're just a really nice way to just keep your body functioning the way that it's supposed to. Cool, so that was a lot of information to cover. Um, does anyone have any questions about what we've covered so far? Or um, you can also take this time to ask any questions about um, topics that are not related to herbs um, and feel free to put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself as well. Um, if we don't have questions, I did kind of uh, section off a small bit of time for a break, but we've actually gone through pretty quickly. So if everybody's okay with that, I think we'll just kind of push on. So I'm going to just skip ahead a little bit. Oh, wait, it looks like you got a question, Emma. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, there are so many books that I would recommend. Um, let's see. Um, if you hang on for one second, I have a book right here. <laughs> if you can see this, um, book here. This one is called Medicinal Plants of the Desert and Canyon West. This was written by Michael Moore, um, who was a very proficient herbalist who practiced here in New Mexico. 
Um, this book is really cool. Um, it goes into details about all kinds of native plants to New Mexico um, and kind of like the Rockies area. Um, any books that you find by Michael Moore are going to be really useful ones. And I can type in actually in the chat um, the name of this book. Um, But yeah, I would recommend anything that he's written. Um, and also, um, there's another, <laughs> there, there's just so many books. Um, I'll put them in the chat. And um, yeah, that way you have access to those. And then maybe we can put that as um, a resource that's available um, somewhere. Yeah, we could definitely make like a a reading list and and share it out. Shall we get into the next section? Sure. Yeah, let's move on. Um, so this section is going to go over the different types of herbs that are included in your gardening kit. Um, so just a little disclaimer here, uh, just want to make sure that before you start any kind of herbal regimen, you consult with your physician first. Um, and the reason for that is that some herbs have different contraindications that can interact negatively with different medications. Um, for example, something like licorice, um, if you're using that, like um, just like natural licorice, I don't mean like the candy or anything like that, um, but the natural licorice uh, can interact with high blood pressure. Um, so just be mindful of that. Um, if you do have any kinds of underlying conditions or anything like that, just be mindful, um, do some research and just make sure that that's going to be safe for you. Um, and always consult your doctor. So, and that's okay, Wells, thank you for joining us. <laughs> So the first herb that we're going to talk about today is holy basil, um, which is also called tulsi. Um, it originated in India. Um, this is an herb that is really commonly used in Ayurvedic practices, which is um, an Indian uh, originated type of uh, holistic wellness. So. Tulsi is an adaptogen. Um, it's also an alterative. It is man antimicrobial. Um, so it has antibacterial and antiviral properties. It's also a carminative. So it's great for digestion. Uh, it's also a demulcent. So it's going to be one of those ones that helps to soothe your, um, your mucous membranes. It's a diaphoretic, <laughs> it's an expectorant, a nervine, and a tonic. So it's really um, like the holy grail of herbs. It can help your system in so many different ways. And the cool thing about it is that it's an adaptogen, which means that um, it's going to work with your whole body to help to balance all types of different functions. It's most commonly used for its adaptogen and nervine properties. So uh, it's really great for calming your nerves. Um, if you're feeling stressed or anxious about anything, um, it helps to reduce your cortisol levels. And um, it's especially, especially helpful if you're someone who deals with chronic stress, which is a lot of us. Um, so. It can be taken as a tonic, meaning that this is something that you can take every day. 
and it's best used as an internal medicine. So um, this is one that you can use as a tincture, uh, which means that it's been um, concentrated into alcohol or vinegar, uh, some other type of liquid substance other than water um, that you can take uh, daily. You can also infuse it as a tea, or one of my favorite ways to use this is infused in honey. Um, and then for making this type of medicine, you would use all the flower and leaf parts. The next one we're gonna talk about is calendula. Um, this is an herb that is typically used more as a topical medicine. Uh, so something that you would use on your skin. Um, it is an alterative, so it does help to balance your body's natural functions. It's an analgesic, so it's also really effective for reducing pain or inflammation. It's also an antimicrobial, so it can help to reduce infection. Um, and it's also an astringent and emollient. Um, so that means that it's really soothing to the skin and also can help to draw out any kinds of toxins or foreign bodies like splinters. Um, so for those reasons, calendula is most uh, commonly used for speeding the healing of wounds. Um, it's really effective for any kinds of cuts, scrapes, bruises, burns, uh, sunburns, and insect bites. So it can be really soothing for all different types of skin irritations. Um, it can also be really effective for things like diaper rash. Um, you can also use it for eczema, um, really any kind of skin condition that you might have that's bothering you. Calendula is going to be a really good go-to herb for that. If you take it internally, it's a diaphoretic, which means that it will help to raise your body temperature, which helps you to sweat. Um, so if you do have an illness, it can help um, break a fever, basically, by uh, naturally making your fever more productive and clearing out different toxins. Um, for calendula, the part that you wanna use for making medicine is gonna be the flower. The next herb that we're gonna talk about is catmint, which is also known as catnip. <laughs> um, we know this herb for uh, being highly, highly attractive to some cats, but it's also really effective for humans. <clears throat> It's an antimicrobial. So this is another one that's gonna be really effective for antibacterial or antiviral purposes. Um, it's also an astringent. So if you're using it on your skin, it can help to um, just kind of shrink the tissue to draw out any kinds of like foreign objects and things like that. It's a carminative which means that it's really helpful for digestive issues. And it's also another diaphoretic. Um, so it's another one that can help to raise your body temperature to help you sweat. Um, it's most common use is as a nervine. So it helps to reduce your stress and cortisol levels um, by targeting your nervous system. And it is a tonic, which means that it's one that you can use every day. Um, I really like catmint um, for its carminative pro properties, um, especially for pregnant and nursing women. This is one of the few um, common herbs that uh, can be taken by pregnant women. Some herbs are not recommended, so um, make sure that you, again, consult with your doctor if you are pregnant or nursing and make sure that the herbs you're taking are going to be okay for that. Um, but catmint is one, um, especially for women who are suffering from morning sickness um, because of its carminative and nervine properties. 
Um, it's really helpful for any kind of digestive upset, especially if you're suffering from heartburn, um, because it doesn't actually cause the heartburn that sometimes peppermint does. Um, and it has a really minty flavor by itself. So um, it's a really great one to utilize. It's also a little bit sedative. Um, that's its nervine properties coming into play. Um, but it's a really excellent source for stress relief and for getting a restful sleep. So if you're someone who struggles with insomnia um, or if you just have turning thoughts in your head all the time. This is a really nice one that can help you to calm down so that you can go to sleep. Um, this one is used as a tea most commonly, um, but it's another really great one that I love to infuse in honey. Um, and you can just take a spoonful of that or mix it into a different type of tea. And leaves and the stems are used for making medicine on this one. The next one we're gonna talk about is echinacea. Uh, echinacea, um, you're probably gonna hear about this one most commonly for its uh, antimicrobial properties um, because it's a really great immunity booster. Um, it does have pain relieving properties, uh, which is its analgesic uh, action. Um, my antimicrobial, so antibacterial, as well as antiviral. Um, it is an astringent, so if you do use it for skin, um, it's another one that you can use for um, like speeding up the healing of wounds and getting rid of any kinds of toxins or splinters and things like that. And it's also a diaphoretic, so it's another one that's going to help you to sweat out any kinds of illnesses. Um, so that makes it a really effective herb for when you are sick or when you are about to get sick. <laughs> um, it can help to protect against illness, uh, which is its most common usage. Um, and it can also help to shorten the length of illness. Um, and it works by raising your white blood cell count. Um, and it makes a fever more productive with its diaphoretic properties. Echinacea is not intended to be used daily, um, and this is a common misconception about it. Um, a lot of times people use echinacea and just like load up on it <laughs> um, and use it every day with the intention of preventing any kind of illness. Um, it actually loses its effectiveness that way um, and can actually harm your liver if you do take it every day. So this is something that you really want to pull out of the cabinet, like when you need it. So as soon as you start getting those body aches or like the body chills, things like that, when you feel that oncoming of being sick, this is when you want to use echinacea. Um, for echinacea, the whole plant is used for medicine. But um, typically, the roots are used uh, if you're making a topical medicine. And then you want to use the leaves and the flowers if you're using it for an internal purpose. And then the last one that we're going to talk about today is chamomile. Um, so this is a very common herb. Um, Everybody is pretty familiar with it. Um, but these are some of the properties that it has. Um, it's an analgesic, so it is going to have some pain relieving properties. It's also antimicrobial, so it's got those awesome antibacterial and antiviral properties. It's also a carminative, so it's going to help with your digestive system, um, which is why we sometimes give chamomile to kids who are having little tummy aches. Um, it's also an emollient. So this one is really great for your skin also with helping to soothe and, um, moisturize, uh, your skin. Um, 
It's also a nervine, so it's really great for your nervous system. That's why it's also a really great one for um, taking for insomnia. If you're having any kind of trouble sleeping or if you're dealing with stress, it's a really great one for that. And it's also a tonic. So this is one that you can use every day. Um, it's best known, like I said, for its mild sedative effect. So um, lots of people are familiar with sleepy time tea. Um, it has mainly chamomile as its main ingredient. Um, and that's because it does help with sleeping and it's really effective for treating an upset tummy. Um, this is also another herb that is safe for pregnant and nursing women as well as children. Um, so that's why it's one of the best herbs that you can keep in your cabinet. Um, it's just great for so many things. Um, it's most traditionally used internally. Um, you can use it as a tea, but you can also infuse it in honey. Um, topically, it's a really great one to infuse in oil, and it's just really, really nice for your skin. Um, all of the properties that it has kind of internally, it's also great for it externally. Um, so it's a, one that you can pair with calendula or other types of topical herbs to just create um, like a really nice skin, a skin soothing uh, type of herb. Oh, and for this one, the flowers are typically used for medicine. Awesome. I just want to pause there for one quick second and make sure, does anybody have any questions about the herbs that we've covered so far? Okay. Well, if there are no questions right now, we're going to go straight into making medicine. Um, so just make sure that when you are making medicine, that you completely dry your plant parts before you use them. Um, the reason for that is that sometimes when plants still have some moisture in them, um, it can cause mold growth. It can cause like botulism, depending on like what kind of container you're using, um, all kinds of different things. So just make sure that your plants are completely dry when you use them. Cool. So the most common way to use herbs is using uh, them in a tea or what we call a decoction, which is just a really super concentrated type of tea. So if you're making a tea, um, you're probably pretty familiar with just like little tea bags. Um, and typically those hold about one tablespoon of plant material. So that's about how much you want to use if you're making your own tea blend at home. Um, so one tablespoon of plant material per one cup of water. You're going to want to boil the water and then just let the plant material sit um, in the water for like five to ten minutes. And then you want to take your tea bag or if you're using um, like a little tea strainer. Um, just squeeze it out so that you can get all of the yummy goodness that's in all of the plant material. If you're making a decoction, um, which is better for um, like if you need a stronger medicine, um, like echinacea might be one that you want to get a really strong concentration of. Um, you want to use three tablespoons of plant material per one cup of water. And this one, um, you probably want to make a bigger batch um, just because the amount of water that you're going to use, um, it can burn off if you're simmering it for the longer period of time that's needed. Um, you want to simmer it for like 20 to 45 minutes. So just keep that in mind. Um, I would recommend probably doing at least two cups of water. Um, or more. So just use the appropriate ratios for your plant material to water, and then make sure that you're simmering it for at least 20 minutes. And then you just want to strain the material um, 
And then the liquid is what you want to keep. So if you're not able to drink all of it at one time, you can keep it in the refrigerator um, and then just kind of take it as a dosage, um, however often you would like to throughout the day or throughout the next couple of days. Um, you probably don't want to keep any kind of tea or decoction longer than two or three days. Making tinctures is the next most common way to use herbs. Um, you can get super, super technical <laughs> with how you make your tincture. Um, but for today, we're just going to go the basic route. Um, my favorite uh, liquid to use is alcohol, um, just because the herbs extract a lot easier from alcohol than they do from other types of liquids that you could use. Um, vinegar is typically the other type of liquid that's used for making a tincture. Um, so when you do make a tincture, um, if you're using alcohol, Everclear is best because it has the least amount of water added to it. Um, so it's going to give you a much stronger kind of tincture than other types of alcohol. That said, you could use other types of alcohol. Um, you could make something out of bourbon. You could use vodka. Um, Whiskey, there's all kinds of different things that you could use. Um, but for the purpose of making medicine, like I said, Everclear is probably the best one. Um, the way that I do tinctures and the way that I was taught is to just um, basically fill up a jar three quarters of the way with your plant material. Um, you don't want to pack it down. You just want it to be loose in there so that the liquid has lots of room to move between the plant material. And then just fill up your jar with whatever type of alcohol or vinegar you're using all the way to the top of the jar. There should be at least one inch between the top of the plant material and the liquid. Um, and again, you don't want a whole lot of space between the top of the jar, or sorry, the top of the liquid and the lid of the jar. Um, you want enough that you can plant, I mean, shake the jar to mix up the plant material and the liquid, um, but you don't want to leave a lot of space between the liquid and the top lid. Um, so then you're going to let the plant material infuse, um, or just another way to say that is to just draw out all of the good stuff <laughs> that's in the plant material um, for six, uh, four to six weeks. Um, and that's gonna give it enough time to really break down the plant material and get all of the different um, medicines out of the plant. Um, I like to have this as kind of like a daily ritual that I do. Um, after I make my coffee in the morning, I go and I give all of my jars a little shake. <laughs> um, and that way um, it just makes sure that everything is mixed in really well. So after four to six weeks, you're going to strain it. Um, I like using a coffee filter because it gets out all of the like tiny plant material and just gives you a much cleaner um, kind of tincture. Um, sometimes if there's too much plant material that's still in there, um, it can just cause it to go bad uh, earlier than it would uh, if you strained out all of the plant material. Um, you can also use like a cheesecloth or if you have old um, bedding, like sheets. Uh, sheets are a really great type of fabric that you can use that would help to strain out um, all of the plant material, kind of similarly to a coffee filter. Um, so if you have any old sheets and things like that that you can cut up, um, that's a great way to use those things and recycle them. 
And then lastly, just make sure that you squeeze it as much as you can to get all of the liquid out. And um, that's going to make sure that you get all of the good medicinal properties out of the plant and into your tincture. Um, and then you can either keep it in a jar or if you want to put it into smaller containers, um, they make all kinds of different containers of all different sizes. So um, it's really up to you and your preference on how you want to store it. And from Wells, I see a question here. Would a t-shirt work too? Yes, absolutely. Um, you can cut up old clothing. I mean, as long as it's clean, um, you can really use any type of fabric. Um, T-shirt material is great because it's stretchy. So when you're doing that final squeezing, um, it's easier to make sure that you're getting all of that good stuff out. Um, and Susan also asked a question during the four to six weeks, where are the jars stored fridge, a room with or without light? Great question. Um, typically it's best to keep them in a dark place. Um, you don't want them to have a whole lot of exposure to light. Um, but you don't need to keep it in the fridge. So for me, um, I just have like a little cabinet uh, in my utility room. Um, I just keep all of my jars in there. Um, and that way that keeps them protected from the light. It's not too hot, not too cold. It's just kind of room temperature. Um, that's what you want for making your tincture. Awesome. So next we're gonna move into infused oil. Um, so the infused oil is um, basically the main ingredient for if you're going to make a salve um, or some kind of balm that you're gonna use topically. Uh, so something that you're gonna be using on your skin. You're basically going to use the same method that you would use for doing a tincture, but you're going to use oil instead. Um, typically, olive oil is the best oil to use because it has the longest shelf life. Um, so other types of oils are kind of going to go rancid a little bit sooner. Um, olive oil is like the tried and true way to make sure that your infused oil is gonna last a long time. Um, that said though, there's nothing wrong with using a different type of oil. Uh, some of my favorites are avocado oil and coconut oil. Um, they're just really, really nice for your skin. Um, sunflower oil and sesame oil are a couple of others that are really great to use as well. Um, I would recommend if you do make an infused oil, just go to the culinary section of the grocery store where they have all of the different types of oil. Um, that's gonna be the most cost-effective way um, to use an infused oil. You'll notice if you go into a health food store and go to the cosmetic section, they're gonna have the same types of oil. <laughs> but they're gonna be two or three times the cost uh, than it, they would be if you just purchased them from the culinary section. And it's the same oil, there's nothing different about it. <laughs> um, so just keep that in mind when you're going shopping for the oil that you wanna use. The cool thing about doing an infused oil is that you don't necessarily have to wait the four to six weeks for your oil to infuse. There's a quicker way that you can do it. Um, I like to just make a, a hot water bath by filling up a crock pot with water. And then you just place your jar with your plant material and your oil. Um, with the lid on, you don't want it closed all the way, um, but you want the lid to kind of sit on top so that it keeps any of the steam out of your jar. Um, and so, yeah, just set the jar in the hot water bath, turn your crock pot to its lowest setting. So for mine, it has just a warm setting. That's what I use. Um, 
And then you want to let it sit there for one to two days and just monitor it regularly. Sometimes crock pots can get weird <laughs> uh, with their temperature. I know mine does. So I have to regularly just make sure that it's not getting too hot. Um, so if it does, I'll turn it off for a little while and then turn it back up to the warm temperature. Um, if it seems like it's getting too hot, too fast. Um, and then when you're done, you just want to strain the oil same way that you do for the tincture. Um, this is another great way to use uh, either old clothing or um, old sheets, anything like that. Um, and just keep in mind that this is going to get messy. <laughs> Um, so make sure that anything that you are using, that it's okay to have oil stains, um, or that it's something that you can throw away later. Um, and then just make sure that the space that you're using is also kind of protected. Um, cause again, oil can get really messy. Um, and then, uh, the last thing with the oil, um, you can either use it as it is, um, if you want to just kind of use it in like a little dropper bottle or um, a smaller container, you can use it as like a massage oil or, um, you know, just use little dabs of it for any areas that you're um, experiencing some kind of skin issue. Or you can mix it with beeswax to make a salve. And that's one of my most favorite ways to make a medicine. Um, cool. Thanks, Kateri. <laughs> All right. Now, my other most fam favorite uh, way to make medicine is to infuse honey. Um, I like to purchase honey from local uh, beekeepers. Um, the reason for that, I don't really buy uh, grocery store honey, uh, and that's because um, any type of local honey that you're using is going to be really awesome for not just its flavor, um, but it's also going to have lots of um, antihistamine properties, um, which means that they're going to be great for controlling your allergies. If you're someone who suffers from any type of seasonal allergies, um, local honey, um, as long as you're taking that on a regular basis, can actually help to reduce your symptoms of allergies. Um, not just that, but it's a great way to support a local business. Thank you, <laughs> Wells. Yeah. Um, so with honey, um, it's basically the same method for using, uh, or for making infused oil or for tincturing. Um, the only thing is that honey is extremely heat sensitive. It starts to lose some of its medicinal properties, uh, and it just breaks down and gets kind of funky if it gets too hot. So don't use the crock pot method for infusing your honey. Um, Patience is the best method, and I'll tell you, it, it is so worth it. Um, so basically, same, same thing. You just want to let it sit uh, for four to six weeks. You're going to use the same kind of ratios for your plant material and the honey. Just keep in mind that honey is going to be um, not quite as liquidy as oil or alcohol or vinegar. Um, so you want to give the plant material just a little bit more space. Uh, and again, just make sure that you're not packing the plant material into your jar. Um, and that's just going to make it a lot easier for it to mix together. Then uh, when you're ready to strain the honey, um, then you can put it in a hot water bath. I probably would not let it sit for longer than maybe five or 10 minutes um, because again, it's really heat sensitive. So you don't want it to get anything above like, I would say like 80 degrees, um, maybe like 90. <laughs> um, 
that's probably the hottest that you want it to be. Um, so again, you're just going to make sure that you squeeze out all of the plant material as much as you possibly can. Um, this can be a really fun activity for kids to do because it is really messy, uh, but it's also a really sweet <laughs> activity to do. Um, so if you have kids helping you with squeezing it out, um, they really enjoy uh, getting messy and being able to eat the honey as they're going. So um, just keep in mind, it's going to be really messy. It's okay to get your hands dirty. Um, and it's going to be worth it, definitely, for making infused honey. All right. And then lastly, um, making salve is one of my other most favorite uh, medicine types. Um, and it's really, really easy to make. If you're doing infused oil, you already have the main ingredient, and then you just need beeswax. Um, you can buy pelleted beeswax, which means it's just like broken down into small little pieces, which makes it a little bit easier to melt. Um, otherwise, again, I would definitely recommend going with a local beekeeper. Um, it just keeps dollars uh, local and um, is a really great way to support local farmers and local beekeepers. Um, you do have to have slightly special equipment <laughs> for making a salve. Um, I like to use a double boiler, um, which is just basically a pot that has another pot that will sit on top of it. Um, but you can make your own, basically, as long as you have a Pyrex bowl, um, or if not Pyrex, another type of bowl that is okay for exposing to heat. Um, so just make sure that whatever bowl you're using, on the bottom of it, it should say whether it's okay um, to have over a pot. It'll have like little symbols on it, usually. Um, if it doesn't specify that it's okay to use with heat, I would not use it. It's probably going to break. <laughs> um, and that's not, that's not helpful for anything. So, um, for using it as a double boiler, um, you just want the bowl to sit over the water, not in it. So you'll just kind of place it on top of the pot. Um, and then just make sure that the way that it's sitting, that the bottom isn't touching the water that's inside the pot. Um, you'll bring the water to a simmer. You don't want it to be boiling. You just want it to kind of be sitting there at a good hot temperature. And then you'll add your beeswax first. Um, you want the beeswax to melt completely before you add the oil. And that's just going to make sure, again, that your oil doesn't get too hot. Um, once the beeswax is melted, just add the oil and then you want to stir it together really good. Um, and then from there, you just pour it into smaller containers. Um, you see on the slide, this little picture of a jar. Um, you can get all types of different sizes uh, online. Um, or uh, I like to reuse jars. So often like I'll use like little jam, jam jars or um, different jars that I use for condiments. Um, as long as I wash them really good, they're awesome to use uh, for holding my salves. Um, so how much beeswax to use? Uh, it really just depends on how soft or how hard you want your salve to be. Um, I like using a softer salve um, just because the softer it is, uh, the easier it's going to absorb in your skin. So um, for a soft salve, which is kind of like the consistency of an ointment um, that would come out of like a tube or something like that. You would just use one part beeswax to six parts oil. Um, so you want the 
portion of beeswax to be a lot smaller uh, than the amount of oil that you're using. If you want to make a harder salve, uh, something that's like closer to like a lip balm, then you would use the ratio of like one part beeswax to three parts oil or one part beeswax to four parts oil. Um, and it's okay to play. Um, it's really like an experiment. <laughs> Anytime I do it, sometimes uh, I don't measure. I like to just eyeball things, which is totally fine. Uh, but sometimes that leaves you open to having, you know, maybe a salve that's a little harder or softer than you intended. Um, so just experiment is what I would say. Um, find out what works best for you. And then uh, it always helps me to write down recipes, like exactly how much I'm using. Um, if I'm eyeballing things, then I might write a recipe that's like a quarter of the jar is this type of oil or whatever. So I hope that helps. <laughs> And yeah, um, I hope that this has been helpful for learning a little bit about herbs and hopefully gets you on your medicine making journey. Um, does anybody have any questions for us at this time? Yeah, thank you, Susan. I'm glad. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Oh, well, thank you for joining us, guys. Um, this was really interesting, Emma. Uh, thank you so much. Um, our next workshop, there's going to be a few weeks in between. Uh, we'll join again together on the 27th of May. Uh, same time though, 1030. Um, and we're going to just talk a little bit about um, just some of the basics that you need to know if at some point um, you maybe want to um, start growing for market. So whether that be veggies or herbs like we just covered, um, we'll just give like a really basic overview of some of the points that you want to hit um, in order to do that. Um, and we'll also, of course, um, set aside plenty of time for Q&A um, for any of the other kinds of materials or questions that we've covered um, throughout the workshops. Um, so go ahead and do make sure to join us for that. Um, it should be interesting. Even if um, you're not really sure if you wanna do that, um, it's still good information to know. Um, and then I will encourage you all also to join the Facebook group or follow us on any of our social media platforms. Um, and that's also probably where we will post those um, kind of recommended readings um, and reading lists uh, that we were talking about earlier in the workshop. So we'll try to put something cool together that you can um, refer to uh, for your next trip to the bookstore or the library. Um, Thank you so much, Amber. Um, yeah, so unless there's any more questions right now, um, we'll go ahead and close this out, but always feel free to reach out to us either on our social medias or at info at centerofsouthwestculture.org or our main number there. Um, we're happy to help and answer any questions. So thank you, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Thanks, everybody.